Um, okay, so our presenter today is Austin Little. Austin is a University of Illinois Extension Horticulture educator. He covers Jackson, Franklin, Williams, and Randolph and Berry counties. Um, with that, I will go ahead and let Austin take it away. Hello, and thank you, Maggie, for the wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone, today, and welcome you today for the first installment of the Greening Up series. And so this is a series focusing on green infrastructure. And today's topic will be an overview and kind of an introduction to the practices and the different systems of green infrastructure. So a little bit of background. Uh, of me, my academic and professional career, I've gotten, I've been lucky and fortunate and gotten the opportunity to work closely with several of these green infrastructure systems. And over the years, it has become a great area of passion and interest for me. So today, I would like to give you an overview and a bit of background on the concepts of green infrastructure, and then briefly introduce you to green roofs green walls, rain gardens, and permeable pavement systems. And as Maggie mentioned, in the following webinars in this series, we will take a more in-depth look into each of these systems and kind of how they work. And we'll even show you around each of these installations at uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And so without further ado, let's dive into green infrastructure. Okay. So, green infrastructure, what does that word mean and uh, what's it all about? So, green infrastructure is best defined by the EPA, uh, by their uh, Clean Water Act definition. And that is a range, so Green infrastructure is a range of suites or, or a range or suite of practices that use plant-based systems, permeable pavement, or other kind of permeable systems or substrates, uh, stormwater harvesting or reclamation, using landscape systems to store rainwater, filter, or evapotranspirate stormwater and reduce flows to sewer systems, storm sewer systems, or to other surface waters. So, to kind of sum that up, green infrastructure offers a more natural, biological, or environmentally balanced approach to stormwater management and mitigation of uh, stormwater um, uh, runoff. And so as an alternative, this is an alternative to what's called single purpose gray stormwater management systems, which are streets, uh, drainage gutters, drainage culverts, and ultimately storm sewers. Now, some of this gray water is processed and treated for municipal water supplies, but other times, often, it's directed towards open water bodies, rivers, uh, lakes, uh, even oceans, this kind of thing, depending on the city um, and their, their uh, stormwater management systems. So when green infrastructure, such as green roofs, rain gardens, and permeable pavement systems are used in combination or in concert with each other in urban areas, they can have a wide range of positive impacts on the environment, uh, social and public well being, and even economies. And here we see a green roof, a green wall there. And this would be like a, like a rain garden or bioswale here. And we'll talk a bit more about each of those. But let's uh, quickly look at what's happening with stormwater in the built environment. So, so where is this stormwater going? Uh, basically, the more developed uh, an urban area is with Im impervious surfaces uh, in cities like Chicago or St. Louis or Nashville, uh, uh, such as uh, buildings, the more buildings there are, sidewalks, streets, uh, there becomes less green space to naturally process stormwater and therefore a higher volume of stormwater overflow is being directed and processed through passive gray water management systems. And so as we tend to get more frequent heavy rain events, especially uh, in the Midwest, these systems will 
tend to get overloaded and cause major problems like urban flooding, uh, water pollution, and erosion. So it's, it's important to consider that a lot of these uh, gray water storm management systems are aging out. Some, some are uh, over 100 years old still. So, so these, these systems were not built to, to manage and process the, uh, the um, levels of, of rainwater that they're now uh, being, uh, uh, being used for, being used uh, uh, to process. And so uh, the main purpose of green infrastructure systems is to kind of recreate that environmental benefit, that envir environmental ability to process and recycle rainwater. And uh, this is increasingly important as uh, areas, uh, as, as more and more areas become more urbanized. And there are a wide range of infrastructure practices in this suite of green infrastructure in use today. But in this series, we're primarily focusing on green roofs, green walls, permeable pavement systems, and rain gardens. And so next Friday, we will focus specifically on green roofs. And the rain garden session is already proverbially in the bag, so to speak, and it can be viewed at this link here on our uh, unit, uh, our, our extension unit uh, YouTube channel. So I'd, I'd highly encourage you to check that out. And some other green infrastructure practices worth mentioning are going to be things like uh, creating more green space, just simply creating more green space, uh, tree canopies in cities. So mature trees act as, air, as uh, natural air conditioners in, uh, in the hot summer months, and they soak up massive amounts of water. And so in areas with more tree cover, with more tree canopy, uh, those areas are significantly cooler in the summer than, than more sparsely vegetated areas. And there's other things like bioswales, rain harvesting, uh, city planter boxes, and uh, landscaping for dry areas, which is known as uh, xeriscaping. And so all of these are important aspects of uh, creating a sustainable urban environment. And so um, kind of the, the real um, kind of uh, uh, implementation of these things, kind of, kind of the momentum really started, uh, the green revolution in landscape architecture really started to gain momentum in the early 1970s as landscape architects and developers really began placing more emphasis and focus on uh, sustainable uh, development in, in the built environment. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a nice painting of uh, what, what could be almost called a sponge city. So in, uh, in metropolitan areas in other parts of the world, in China, uh, in uh, Asia, they're developing what are called uh, sponge cities. So, so this uh, EPA program, the Soak Up the Rain, is a public outreach and education program designed to raise awareness about the costly impacts of polluted stormwater runoff and encourage uh, use and uh, uh, adapt or adoption of stormwater rules requirements through nature-based solutions such as green infrastructure and low impact development. So here we can kind of see how these might fit in to, uh, to urban planning. So we have tree canopies, rain barrels, rain gardens, green roofs, uh, greening up uh, er, uh, sidewalks and um, introducing more green space there and then perme uh, uh, permeable paving or pervious concrete so all of these in combination really contribute to reducing that amount of stormwater runoff and, and receiving all these other benefits from, from doing that and kind of adopting these practices. So this is something to take a look at uh, for, your own re for your own research and, uh, and uh, personal development. Okay, so let's take a look, a closer look at some of these uh, major environmental, social, and economic benefits that we can uh, realize from green infrastructure. So the primary environmental benefit of green infrastructure and really the primary purpose or function is stormwater reclamation, interception, and recycling. And so that includes 
filtering and uh, cleaning water, removing sediments, chemicals, toxins, and other pollutants that water is picking up in the, uh, in the urban environment. And even in, even in uh, uh, lawns and these kind of things, they pick up sediments and, and, and so forth. So um, green infrastructure can contribute to filtering out 90% of these pollutants. Um, green infrastructure also recharges soil and groundwater. It reduces flooding and erosion. And if these systems are widely adopted uh, in an urban environment, up to 80% of uh, city stormwater can be effectively caught and recycled. So that's really uh, impressive. And now let's take a quicker, a quick look at some of the social and economic benefits as well. So some of the social benefits of greening up cities, it, it includes improved air and sound quality. Uh, so that's reduced noise pollution. And, and it may not be immediately obvious if you're, if you're not in a city, but when you're in a city, you quickly realize the difference in the noise pollution to a more rural environment. Um, and that has health impacts on, on, on the public. So uh, that improves public health. And uh, green infrastructure contributes to reducing the urban heat island effect by a whopping 45 degrees. So uh, these systems keep cities cooler in the hottest parts of the summer. Uh, they also increased outdoor amenity and activity, which is also a public health benefit. And uh, it reduces urban flooding, which, in, which also increases community health and well-being. So uh, green infrastructure also offers important economic and uh, important um, economic and social benefits. And so some of these economic benefits are increased property values of 10 to 30 percent or more, uh, reduced energy costs from uh, heating and cooling. So we're, we're using less, uh, less electricity. Uh, reduced load on the gray water infrastructure, as we, as we talked about, and increased job opportunities in the environmental and green industry. So the more of these systems uh, that, are, that are implemented and introduced, uh, that's going to create uh, more jobs in, in, that, uh, in those uh, uh, employment sectors. Okay, so... Now we're gonna look at green roofs, just briefly kind of introduce these, uh, green roofs, green walls, uh, rain gardens, and permeable pavers. Okay, um, so each of these green infrastructure systems are, we have examples of these at SIUC, and uh, we'll be looking at each of these in later installments and doing some kind of virtual tours of them as well, so that'll be fun. Okay, so, Green or living walls, they're also called, uh, or green or living roofs, rather, uh, also called living roofs, are, are uh, so by definition, they're going to be at least multi-layered systems with some kind of vegetative cover, a substrate or medium that the plants are growing in, and some form of uh, drainage, some sort of uh, a drainage system there. And uh, this is all going to be on top of some kind of waterproof membrane. Now, there may be other specific layers in there. There may be uh, kind of insulation and other things, integrated irrigation systems, things such as this. But uh, generally, it's going to be a multi-layered uh, vegetated system. And so here, these are a couple shots of the green roof located at the, S at the Southern Illinois University Carbondale Ag Building. And uh, this was installed in 2010, and um, it's a it's a pretty uh, good sized green roof, and it's got different sections. And uh, we do all kinds of uh, interesting research up there. Uh, this is from I believe last year. So in this shot, we've just got some sedums and some wildflowers, things like that. But uh, this year, we've actually introduced some uh, edible ornamental landscaping here that we'll look at in the in the green roof. Uh, section next week. So look forward to that. Okay, so green roofs are categorized as extensive, intensive, and semi-intensive. So what that refers to is the depth of the medium. So for an example here, just to look at the SIUC green roof, this is an example of an extensive green roof. And so extensive green roofs are typically no deeper than 
five inches of uh, soilless medium. And that's what we use up here to, uh, to keep it lightweight. So it's a, so it's a soilless medium, which we'll cover in, uh, in the green roof section. And then it can go up to depths can get as deep as, as, as deep as what the, what the supporting structure can handle. Um, so that can be quite deep. That could be two feet deep, you know, and for an example, uh, Millennium Park in Chicago, parts of, big parts of that are actually a green roof. Many people don't realize that they're standing on a green roof. And uh, some of that is two feet deep. So it's, that's built on top of an extremely, uh, um, an extremely uh, 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 built and, and uh, um, supportive structure. It's, a, it's, it's on top of a parking garage. So, so that's an extremely overbuilt, uh, heavy duty kind of structure that that, that green roof is, is located on. So, and that's really going to kind of uh, direct what kind of plants you can grow on a green roof. So things that are more deep rooted shrubs, trees, uh, and uh, certain kind of native kind of plants that have a lot deeper root systems aren't going to be well adapted to a shallower roof structure like the one at SIUC. However, we still can grow an impressive range of plants up there. Uh, right now we've got tomatoes, peppers, melons going up there. So, so it's still really, interesting what things can adapt to, to that kind of extreme environment. And so modern green roofs, so green roofs have been around for quite a long time. Uh, you could even say that they were in, uh, in, in Mesopotamia and in the, in the hanging gardens and, and, and rooftop gardens in some form thousands of years ago, but the modern version of green roofs were developed in Germany in the 1960s and they were initially developed as, as a uh, natural kind of low impact way to increase uh, fire suppression. So, so to control uh, um, uh, fire, uh, fire control in, in urban environments. So the primary benefits of green roofs are stormwater retention first and foremost. And um, green roofs can reduce the impact of stormwater. It can catch up to 80% in an urban environment. Uh, if, if uh, depending on how widespread uh, the use of uh, green roofs are. So Chicago is a great example. Um, uh, most of their public buildings and a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, other structures have green roofs on them. So they had a huge initiative to, to green up the, the roofs of Chicago. And so that these, uh, these systems can catch up to 80, catch and recycle up to 80% of stormwater uh, that's directed towards that building that would otherwise run off. And there's also associated uh, reductions of energy costs for heating and cooling. Again, uh, this is one of the most important uh, systems to reduce urban heat island effect. It increases urban green space and increases uh, space for urban agriculture. So that's what I did my graduate research on at, at the SIUC Green Roof was um, agricultural, uh, urban agriculture uh, food production. So we looked at uh, fertilizers and, and how, uh, how different fertilizers uh, are effective and um, kind of how they uh, optimize yield uh, in an urban uh, ag, ag environment. Okay, on to green walls. So this is a photo of the green wall at SIUC Ag Building, which we'll take a tour of when we get to the uh, green wall episode. And so uh, the green wall pictured there is, so uh, green walls are also known as living walls or vertical gardens. And uh, so there's many different kinds of green wall systems. And the one pictured here at SIU is a high is what's known as a hydroponic vegetated mat and again we'll talk more about that uh, on the green wall episode but green walls in general are a living architectural feature that utilizes different types of plants or other greenery which are fixed in some way to a vertical surface and they they may have different kinds of irrigation systems drainage systems lighting systems uh, many different types and uh, Generally, they're, they, they utilize tropical plants if they're indoors. And uh, as, an, as an example here, you know, we, it's more of a, it's almost like a work of, a natural work of art. So it's very interesting. And here we see kind of on the other hand, we see an outdoor, this would be a, um, this would be like a, 
a green facade. So this would be more of an architectural outdoor facade. Um, and um, this is in Europe. So this is in Paris. You can see the Eiffel Tower there. And uh, it was designed by Patrick Blanc. So this is uh, the, uh, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that in French, but uh, it's the Museum of Branly Muir. And this is their vegetative facade there. So that's pretty cool. I'd, I'd like to visit that eventually. But interestingly enough, um, green walls were originally, the modern version of a green wall system was invented by a, a professor at the University of Illinois in the 1930s, and his name was Stanley White. Uh, but green walls really didn't pick up momentum and gain popularity until the 1980s uh, in Europe. And one of the kind of the, the founding fathers of the modern green wall movement is uh, Patrick uh, Blanc. And so again, this is, this is one of his uh, works in uh, Paris, but he's got installations all over the world now. And many, uh, many students that have gone on to create amazing green walls and, and uh, installations. And so some of the primary benefits of green walls are improved amenity and aesthetics for, or just improved access and uh, value for users of indoor and outdoor spaces. Uh, another really neat thing that green walls do is they act as an air filter in indoor and outdoor um, environments, uh, circulating uh, CO2 and other air pollutants. Uh, they, can, they can also be used to uh, use gray stormwater if they're outdoors um, or indoors. You can have systems where they utilize uh, stormwater if it's, uh, if it's uh, collected. And they also improve noise quality indoor and, and definitely outside. And so they offer a more natural and uh, inviting indoor environment. Uh, they, they have kind of a therapeutic value, kind of a meditative value in the indoor environment. Um, and you, when you're in kind of, a, kind of a bleak indoor kind of space, they can really do a lot to improve the uh, indoor environment. And uh, they can also be used as added space in urban agriculture. So you can grow edible plants in these as well. Okay, rain gardens, one of my favorites. So uh, really relevant here, we kind of got sloshed with a ton of rain yesterday. So it was, it was nice to have our, our rain gardens here. And uh, rain gardens are also known as bioretention systems. And they are a landscape installation designed to intercept and process urban stormwater runoff. Uh, so rain gardens allow the landscape to naturally process and filtrate and, uh, and reuse excess stormwater, keeping it within the natural environment or the, the, the designed environment. And so rain gardens uh, have probably been used informally in some shape or form for a long time, but kind of the formal design and implementation of rain gardens came to prominence uh, in use by uh, landscape architects in Maryland in the early 90s. That's where we see the modern kind of development of, of rain gardens and bioretention systems. So some of the primary benefits are stormwater management, of course, and uh, controlling and catching urban stormwater runoff from houses, buildings, uh, driveways, um, lawns. Uh, so, and this reduces urban flooding, which is a, which is a really bad thing to happen in, 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 in heavily populated urban areas. Um, Chicago, for just one, not to pick on Chicago, if there's anybody from Chicago, I, I love Chicago, but uh, in, uh, in, in, in the last 30 years, they, they started to develop really bad flooding issues in, uh, in, in some of the more heavily urban populated areas. And so that's why Chicago has, has gone so uh, headfirst into adopting a lot of these uh, green infrastructure systems to mitigate that urban flooding problem. So they've They've uh, in, in introduced green roofs, uh, uh, rain gardens, all, all kinds of water catchment systems. So they've really done a lot to mitigate uh, those, uh, those uh, urban flooding problems. And also erosion. So, the, so if we're having moving water across the landscape, that's going to cause erosion as well. So just trying to slow down and catch stormwater is the major role of, of rain gardens. They also reduce overflow on the gray water system. 
Um, so they kind of protect the existing sewer or stormwater sewer systems from overflow. Um, yeah, they improve pollinator habitat, which is a huge uh, benefit uh, with native, and, and oftentimes rain gardens. Now, not all of these systems specifically use native plants, but in the case of rain gardens, it's primarily using native, uh, ecologically native plants uh, that are going to be uh, better, uh, more uh, kind of active habitat for our native pollinators, and that's kind of a big deal. So for example, they oftentimes have uh, butterfly milkweed and the monarch is kind of the poster child for uh, pollinator conservation. So there's that really uh, cool part of it. And it's also really educational for uh, anybody of any age really. Uh, so it's an all, also just a, a really kind of multifaceted uh, uh, landscape feature. And uh, improves water quality. So again, filtering water, and uh, all of these benefits lead to enhanced property value. <clears throat> and last but not least, we have permeable pavement systems. Okay, so uh, these are pervious, porous, or permeable pavement systems, and they are a sustainable paving feature that allows stormwater to move through or around the pavement to reduce stormwater runoff. Now, there are different kind of forms of pervious or porous pavement systems. So the one we see here at SIUC, uh, if you can see my cursor here, now this is re or recycled uh, fly ash from uh, concrete manufacturing. So it's a recycled material. Now with this system, the water isn't moving through the block. It is, the, this system is designed to make water uh, infiltrate in between, so through the seams here, and they use kind of a kind of a, a lightly packing concrete sand so that water can flow through here, and then underneath it is a couple feet of, uh, of gravel, so a, a, a small grade gravel. And so previously in this kind of section here at uh, near the Ag Building, this is Thompson Woods here if you've ever been to SIUC, but uh, previous to this installation, there, were, there was flooding uh, issues over here because uh, the ag building is kind of a big flat hardscape surface, not a lot of green space. So uh, water was pooling up on the sidewalk, which is an issue with, oops, got away from me there. So this, that's an issue when you have students and, and uh, faculty and people walking through here, uh, walking through uh, you know, a half a foot of water, that's, that's a problem. Um, and so this kind of helps to pull uh, more, more uh, efficiently all of that, that uh, overburden of stormwater. And then we've got Thompson Woods right here, so it's able to uh, percolate back into the soil back here uh, a little bit more efficiently. Now on the other hand, this is on the green roof, and this was uh, a grant that uh, we won uh, for these por porous pavers on the green roof. So what we had before were kind of these uh, spongy pavers that tended to hold water for too long uh, and uh, didn't really drain that efficiently. And then we had issues with uh, mold and kind of uh, fungal fun fungi kind of growing up there and making it slippery. So uh, that was damaging our, perme our uh, impervia impermeable uh, layer there and uh, was a, was what ca caused other issues. So we, we applied for this uh, uh, grant through SIU through the Green Fund and, and uh, fortunately won that grant. And so these permeable uh, porous pavers are still up there and they're great. We installed these I think in 2015 and uh, as you can see, so porous here. So as opposed to this system, the water is just moving right through uh, this tile. It just, it just drains right out, right through. And uh, so porous uh, pavers are made out of different materials. Um, typically, they're gonna be reclamated, recycled materials from manufacturing. Um, you know, some are better than others. These are made out of uh, recycled plastic and rubber, and they're very durable. And uh, I, I haven't seen really any breakdown of them in, the, in now the five years, that, uh, or four or five years that they've been installed. But uh, there's other materials, um, and these are lightweight too. They're not very heavy, which is important to keep our weight load down on the roof. And uh, there are other types. There's glass, and uh, glass, um, those, it depends on the, 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 the process of manufacturing, but the one, we, we tried some, and they fell apart. They weren't very good. 
they're kind of sharp too. So these are a big improvement. And um, interestingly, uh, some form of permeable pavement has been around since the 1800s. So that's when they kind of uh, first developed pervious concrete uh, to try to move water off roadways. And uh, well, it would have been, uh, yeah, roadways for at that time, uh, horses and, and people that's in carts and that kind of thing. But to, just to try to move that water off the street was just as important then as it is now. Now the modern kind of implementation and, and uh, you know, adoption of permeable paving systems really didn't take place until the 1960s. So post-World War II, when there was a lot of reconstruction in Europe happening, they were looking at kind of sustainable ways. That's when they started to look at um, kind of low impact, uh, um, more efficient ways to, to build cities at that point in Europe. Uh, and then in the 1960s, they really started to become adopted in, uh, in the United States. And so uh, you can find permeable pavement systems in parking lots, sidewalks, even streets uh, will use um, permeable paving systems in combination with these other uh, green infrastructures that we've talked about. And so the primary benefits here are urban runoff, um, primarily to control stormwater management and uh, deal with that stormwater quickly before it uh, is redirected to the gray water systems, which reduces urban flooding. And it also improves uh, the uh, aesthetics and um, accessibility to uh, and uh, city streets. So it makes them uh, just it improves them, makes them nicer, more inviting, and uh, improves the overall usability of of uh, urban uh, streets and sidewalks. And that, by extension, enhances property value. So you're improving driveways, parking lots, uh, making them. You know, you don't think of a parking lot as being somewhere where you'd really want to spend a lot of time, but um, just one example, uh, the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden front parking lot has some permeable pavers from, I think they're probably 20 or 30 years old, but um, it's really kind of an inviting place. Um, and we'll look at those more when we get to permeable pavers, but they can really kind of improve these more kind of utilitarian areas and improve their environmental impact as well. And so again, here we've just uh, kind of talked about the, the, the more, I would say the more kind of uh, uh, complex and um, popular green infrastructures, but you know, uh, rainwater harvesting is also important. Um, it's a great way to lower uh, stormwater uh, over, um, overburden in, in uh, heavily urbanized areas. They've used that to, to a wide extent in Nashville to get their urban flooding under control to uh, great effect. And again, kind of these other uh, associated, uh, um, you know, these associated systems, uh, something as simple as downspout disconnection in, uh, in Washington and Oregon uh, helped to reduce stormwater uh, overburden uh, in their cities to, to uh, quite an effect. And um, yeah, we kind of looked at a few of these, uh, kind of green streets are combining a lot of these systems like uh, bioswales, planter boxes, greenery. Um, and so bioswales, I guess, just I can mention those quickly. Uh, that might be a kind of a topic for uh, its own, uh, its own uh, talk, but uh, bioswales are generally, uh, they're similar to rain gardens, but they're designed to concentrate and move stormwater um, down a, in, in a certain direction. So maybe moving it towards a rain garden or other kind of catchment. Um, while in this process, uh, um, slowing down the flow of water, uh, removing debris and pollution. And uh, bioswales can also be beneficial in, uh, again, recharging groundwater. So uh, they're usually vegetated um, and uh, mulched with uh, native plants or, or uh, really tolerant plants that can tolerate heat and uh, drought and um, even, you know, standing in water. So these kind of diverse conditions here. And so that I think got done a little earlier than I thought, that's fine. But here's some great resources for your further uh, research here. So these are some good places to get more info and kind of uh, get a little bit more into uh, the uh, proverbial weeds here of um, these different kind of green infrastructure systems. But EPA, Green Infrastructure uh, website is a great place to start. And again, there's that uh, soak up the rain program if you want to take a look at that. I really like the 
green infrastructure write up on the National Resource Defense Council. Now, the American Society of Landscape Architects is a, uh, they have a periodical journal where they feature all kinds of really interesting and cutting edge green infrastructure. So that is a cool thing to check out. And uh, the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant is really a great resource. And that's a, a federal grant that uh, started in the 60s and uh, it's used to fund green infrastructure research at universities and non-for-profits. And we, uh, U of I works uh, directly with uh, uh, Purdue in a, in a lot of great projects. So they have some amazing resources there. They've got some, some really outstanding uh, uh, pamphlets and uh, kind of graphical kind of things where they've got like a rain garden guide, um, kind of these, uh, these publications that they come up with are just kind of really, really impressive. So I would recommend checking them out. And uh, if you're interested in something we'll talk about as we get into these other systems is the uh, leadership in energy and environmental design uh, um, certification. And then also uh, LEED is also a uh, rating system for buildings. And that's from the Green Building Council. And so LEED, it, it is, it, it's, it's a, a professional development certification, but it's also used to rate and, uh, and uh, award points to buildings. Now the LEED, uh, the, the uh, LEED point um, certification or um, program is, is really more of a, it's a, um, I wanna say more of a, a symbolic kind of, uh, um, kind of program there. But uh, what it does is it, uh, it shows that buildings are kind of the most environmentally cutting edge that they can be with these lead points. And uh, that goes into marketing and kind of goes into, um, you know, the value of a building. So lead points can be awarded to uh, public buildings. Uh, uh, so, so public uh, municipalities really want to be lead certified and, uh, and have these uh, lead uh, points for their buildings. Um, so that's something to check out. And it can also, you can also lead certify or um, uh, do the lead uh, rating program for uh, uh, private buildings as well for homes, um, which could potentially be something to raise your property value. If you say, hey, this building is lead certified, um, can really uh, be, uh, be quite a benefit. And then we've got the, uh, I, I, I'm sure that people are interested maybe in grant programs. Um, so the two major ones are the um, Illinois uh, Green Infrastructure Grant Program. And uh, right now they're not taking applications, but they, I'm sure they will in the future. And then kind of the next place to look is the um, uh, federal uh, EPA Green Infrastructure Funding Opportunities. And there's definitely gonna be other funding sources out there, grants and these kind of things. Uh, you may even look into you know, your own uh, city and see if there's any kind of uh, tax incentives. A lot of times in, in, in urban areas, more kind of typically kind of closer to more urban centers, they're gonna have tax incentives and um, rebate programs if you, if you invest in some of these uh, green infrastructure programs for your home. Okay, and that actually wraps us up a little bit early.